celebrate his mercy and his grace and what he did for us and shed his precious wonderful blood for us so that we could have forgiveness of our sins and not only forgiveness of our sins but being declared just right right with god righteous and also being able to go to heaven one day and be with him throughout all eternity and it's all because of God's amazing grace and because of the fact that he is a merciful God. As I said a few minutes ago, the Passover meal, the Jews were celebrate. You know, remember what God did for them, the Passover lamb. And all the great miracles that was before that, you know, and delivering them from the power of Pharaoh and from Egypt itself. All of that was a picture of one day what Jesus would do for us on the cross of Calvary. And uh, so as they celebrated and remember what God did for them, what Jehovah God did for them and for their deliverance. Now, this is a Christian's Passover. When Paul said in 1 Corinthians, same book we're looking at. And by the way, you can return to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 if you'd like to, if you get your Bible. Uh, you know, he said, Christ is our Passover. Christ is our Passover meal. And so we do this, as, in a sense, we're doing just like the Jews did on Passover. We're looking back. We're remembering what Jesus did for us. We're remembering what God did for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. So this is a memorial supper as we remember and reflect upon what the, the great price that Jesus paid for us in bringing us salvation and forgiveness of our sins. Now, as you know, in 1 Corinthians, uh, it's a book that, uh, uh, that church had a lot of problems, did it not? If you've ever studied 1 Corinthians, you know that they had a lot of problems within that church. And Paul the Apostle, one of the founders of the church, you know, he addressed some of these problems. That was the problems of division. Some was, you know, they were divided who to follow. There was some were saying, I'm going to follow, you know, Peter. I'm going to follow Apollos. I'm going to follow Paul. Some said, well, I'm just going to follow, bless the Lord, I'm just going to follow Jesus. So that was, that was divisions in the church. That was schisms in the church. Paul addressed that. talks about, matter of fact, when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you'll see here again, He's still talking about the visions within the church. And he's pleading for unity to be in one accord in this, in this group of believers. So he addresses that. And then there's other problems as well. There's a problem of immorality in the church. Uh, a problem with women that they had not disciplined properly. He addresses that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, in the next chapter, chapter 12 on, he addresses the problems of the abuse of spiritual gifts that God had given them. He primarily talks about tongues, how that gift is being abused. And uh, then he addresses some deep theological issues as well. And uh, we see this throughout the book. He talks about the body of Christ. He's saying that, you know, you are the temple of the living Lord. He, he says, you as a church are the temple of the living Lord. And also he says, you as individuals are a temple of the living Lord. The Holy Spirit himself, the, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And uh, you are a temple of the living God. You're the, your body is the Holy of Holies now. So he talks about that. And of course he says, as well, plead for unity. He doesn't like to see this division within the church, so he talks about that. He, and he makes this case, he says, you know what? If you, by your divisions, destroy the body of the church of God, he says, God will take care of you. He'll destroy you as well. So all these problems are addressed. But then he gets to chapter 11. And he talks about some problems that they were having associated with the supper of the Lord. Uh, and what he's talking about here, as we look at this chapter, uh, the second part of the chapter, he talks about some of the problems that was going on when they would have a, a fellowship meal. In that day, they had a fellowship meal. It was called the Agape Love Feast. That's what it was called by the church, the Agape Love Feast. And the, the believers in that day, uh, when they had the Lord's Supper, usually they would have a meal, a fellowship meal as well. And a fellowship meal, they would just gather, they would eat, and they would just have a good time of fellowship. But there were certain things that were happening in this meal that was partaken of that just was not right. And he addresses that. And he says, beginning with verse 18, let's look at that here. He says, first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. For there must be also Heresies, and the word means schisms, factions, divisions here among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. He says, really, when these schisms begin to happen, and you see these divisions over these schisms, these arguments, these debates that's going on in the church, what's going to really happen is the phonies are going to be revealed, and the true believers are going to be revealed as well. 
And that's what he says, what it means that when he, looked, when he quotes that in verse 19. But then he says this in verse 20. When you come together, therefore, to one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone takes before other his own supper. One is hungry, another is drunken. What have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them which and have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you or shall I commend you in this? He says, certainly not, I praise you not. What was happening, and you can read, if you've got a study Bible, you'll read a footnote, but it'll tell you something about this. But what happened was something like this. When they had that fellowship meal, they would also have a practice of bringing in also portions for the poor that was in the church. And also they would make sure that the poor that was in the church, they would make sure that they would get something to eat as well. And everybody would meet together and become one. But the problem was in that day, some of these believers, you know, wouldn't pay any attention, wouldn't care about the poor. They was only looking out for old number one. I would say it's something like this, and you've got to be kind of careful right here. It's like when you have a fellowship meal sometimes, you know, and some people run over several people get to the fellowship meal first and not worried about anybody else. That is the same thing that was happening right here. As a matter of fact, let me read you Dr. Ryder's footnote what he says here about this. He said, The early Christians held a love feast and went in connection with the Lord's Supper, during which they gathered for a fellowship meal. They sent and received communications from other churches and also they collected money for widows and orphans. Apparently, some of the wealthier members were not sharing their food, but greedily consumed it before the poor showed up. So you see what I'm saying? When they run to the table, don't worry about anybody else. I'm going to get fed whether anybody else does or not. If the purposes of the love feast were not being realized, it was better to eat at home. He says you're misbehaving, you're misusing, and you need to correct this and do it right. See what Paul was doing? He's very direct, right? But then right after that, he goes on to share what the, the correct practice of the Lord's Supper itself. He addresses that. He began, we'll begin with verse 23. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I have delivered unto you. In other words, I believe he had a special revelation with the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the celebration of this meal. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now the first thing you need to realize is this. I said it a few minutes ago, but I'll say it again. This is a memorial supper. This is not as some practice today, especially the Catholics believe, and it's, it's a practice they call transubstantiation. You ever heard of that? It's a long word, but what it simply means is when they partake of the Lord's Supper, they actually will say a few words and believe that the elements that they partake of will actually become, become, become the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's called transubstantiation. They would say a few words, and then they would actually believe that the elements would become, listen, the body of Jesus Christ himself. Now, when Jesus inaugurated the supper of the Lord, Matthew chapter 26, he was still sitting there with them when he says, take eat, this is my body, right? So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is simply saying this. When you come together as a group and you celebrate this food, when you take the bread, uh, he, he says, you need to remember me, what I did for you. This is going to represent my body. We drink the wine, the juice is going to represent my blood. Now, Jesus was still there with him, right? So he was not torn apart. He was not there in pieces. He was still right there in person with them when he inaugurated that meal. So this tells us that really this is just a memorial supper. So when we do this, we are remembering him. We are doing this in honor of him. We are remembering everything Christ did for us. The suffering he went through as well, everything he did. So he says, take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. You do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as you often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, this is this, he says, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man, a woman, whoever, examine themselves, and then so let them eat of the bread and drink of that cup. 
For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, not in the right way, right, not in the right manner, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak, sickly among you, and many sleep. That doesn't mean they all take a nap somewhere, does it? Y'all know what that means, right? It means many have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Now, I want to share a little outline with you. I got many, many years ago. I don't know where I got it from. Somebody passed on to me. Well, I did this myself. It doesn't matter. But it's a good outline on this passage of the Lord's Supper. And it helps us to understand why we do this and why Christ wanted us to do this as often as we did. These are the purposes of fact. Number one, every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, every time we do this, what do we do? The Bible says in verse 26, as often as you do this, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Every time we do this, we show in the Lord's death until he comes. That little word show it simply means this. You are proclaiming. You are declaring. You are telling thoroughly what Christ did for us, the Lord's death. What this is actually is, is a visual aid sermon. No better way than to use this to show us what really Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. You are preaching the Lord's death. And that is so important that we do that. Paul, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, same book, chapter 2, verse 2. He said in verse 1, he said, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says, I could overwhelm you with words of wisdom. I could be so eloquent. Paul was very intellectual. We know that. And certainly he could give the best speeches, the best sermons if he wanted to. But Paul says, no, the only thing I want to be, I, what I want to concentrate on simply is this. The death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He says, him crucified. That's what I want to preach. And that's what I want to proclaim. And that is the most important thing that we'll do here today. Why? Because, my friends, if Jesus hadn't died on the cross of Calvary, if he had not suffered and bled and died on the cross of Calvary, if he had not suffered, bled, died, and was buried and raised from the dead, if he had not died, we would have no salvation. Simple as that. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? Every one of us, everyone that's ever been born. Fall short of the glory of God because He's a holy God, He's a perfect God, He's a sinless God. And the Bible says that each one of us, we've got big problems because we're all sinners, right? And we fall short of that glory. And we want to be with God and we want to be forgiven and live with Him forever. We want to have a relationship with Him. Something's got to be done about me, about you, about our sin. Why? Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is eternal death. But God loves us so much, He did something about our sin. The gift of God is, the, is listen, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, Amen. our Savior. Amen. He did what, all, what He did for us on Calvary, my friends, was a way that He could, listen, be just and to justify them that believes in Jesus. He's made a way that He could forgive us of our sins and not at the same time compromise His holiness. Isn't God good? Amen. He didn't do that. So, Listen, each time we meet together to do this, Paul says, number one, we are telling, we are proclaiming, we are preaching, we are giving a visual aid sermon of the Lord's death till he comes. Nothing's more important than that. Secondly, each time we do this, look at verse 24, he says, when you take the bread, you break it, the Bible says, then he says, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do the remembrance of me. Each time we meet together and celebrate the supper of the Lord, communion, each time we take the bread, you know what we need to remember? We need to remember what this bread represents. It represents the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. His body was bruised, beaten badly for us. We need to remember, before we do this, not just do it, my friends, to be doing something. When we take this bread, we need to remember this. Man, Jesus said, this is going to represent my body. Look at what I went through on the cross of Calvary for you. Look how I was beaten. And look how I was beaten before I even went and was nailed to the cross. 
We need to remember how he was scourged, how he was whipped, the beatings that he went through, the, the punches and all that he endured for us, all that he did for us. We need to remember that he gave his body for us. Jesus, my friends, listen. Yes, indeed, he was the Son of God. He was God the Son. He was and he is deity. He is God in flesh. But he also had a body just like you and I did. That's right. And you, when you read the gospel accounts and realize just how much he suffered, yes, indeed, his body was bruised and beaten for you. And we need to not take that light. We need to think about it. And as we're doing it, we need to, we need to say a silent prayer. Say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for going through this for me, for me. He took our punishment upon himself. So each time we do this, now listen, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. We're also saying, listen, he gave his body for us. It was so bad and bruised for us. And then thirdly, we're saying each time we do this, that salvation is only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Y'all realize that? It is only through the blood. And why do I say that? Because shed blood represents a life that has been given. Look at what it says, if you would, in verse 25. He says, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament or new covenant. Replaces the old, because that was all only pointing to the new covenant that would be made in Christ. This is a new testament in my blood this two years you drink it in remembrance of me. Each time we celebrate the supper of the Lord, celebrate communion, the Eucharist, we're saying to all those who are assembled with us, we believe as a church body that salvation, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, is only because of the precious shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We talk about that when we look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 26 through 28, where it says that, you know, that's why he appeared, that's why he was born in Bethlehem, that's why the Son of God stepped out of eternity into the time, that's why he became flesh in order to die for us, and he shed his blood for us. That passage of scripture that tells us in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, let's look at it once more. If you want to, Hebrews chapter 9 and verses 26 and 28, uh, 2 28, but first of all, if you would, look at uh, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer of spring and unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. Verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Was it possible? Was it pleasing to God? Blood of bulls and goats and all those offerings could never, listen, take away our sins. It would only cover them temporarily. One day, Jesus was going to come, which these were pictures of. Jesus is going to come, and when he dies, he's going to pour out his precious shed blood that's going to be the eternal forgiveness of all of our sins. And it will actually do what John the Baptist said. It will take away the sins of the world. Amen? And 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, even says this. Peter says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So again, folks, listen. When we meet together, when we celebrate the supper of the Lord, we are saying to all those who are here, we are saying to ourselves, we are reminding ourselves of this, we remember everything that Jesus did for us, but we're also saying this, that I realize and understand that salvation is only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. Paul actually says in chapter 3 of uh, Romans, the book of Romans, he says we're saved by faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. You've got to put your faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only through the blood of Christ that we have forgiveness of sins. And so... This is what we're saying here today, amen? We're saying we believe that, and we're saying also we're trusting the shed blood to pay for my sins personally. And then we do something else as we celebrate the supper of the Lord. We're doing something that's very important here. We're giving every believer who is present an opportunity to examine themselves. And not only the believers that's present, but especially those that may not be believers of faith. 
And this we always remind everyone who gathers with us. Now, you might be here, you might not be a member of this fellowship. But if you are a born-again believer, if you are saved, if you are a child of God, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, and you know for sure that you are saved, then you're welcome to partake of this supper. But if you're not a believer, if you've never trusted Christ, listen, if you've now put your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, then out of respect for us and the church and the corporate body of Christ, you know, I wouldn't partake of it. I just wouldn't do it. But if you want to make sure that you, listen, if you do, if you do not know Christ, but if you want to come and know him this morning, now's the opportunity to do that. You have an opportunity. Look at what it says in verse 28 again. It says, well, verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's one reason I will not ever participate in what they call floating communion service. Because actually there could be some people in that that's just doing this out of tradition. It's just something to do. It's part of the church here. It becomes a ritual, if you will, with no meaning behind it. And I think that's what it means when it says you're doing it unworthily. Okay? So it, when we do it, we want to make sure it's meaning behind We're doing it the right way. Uh, not only the right way, but we're doing it for the right reason as well. We're remembering what Christ did for us. But then he says in verse 28, look at this, beloved. But let a man, let anyone who's partaken of this supper, examine himself, and then so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I'll start to give a message at one time when I said this. Each time we partake of the Lord's Supper, as we examine ourselves, we ought to look upward, we ought to look inward, we ought to look around. Number one, if you never have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, listen, this is an opportunity to do that. Look upward. Look to Christ. Look at, look at what Jesus did on the cross. When he died on the cross, when he went through all this punishment that I've just been describing, my friends, he did this for you. You understand that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you. God loves you so much that he sent his Son to die in your place. And all he wants you to do is, listen, to believe that, believe the gospel, you know, acknowledge that you are a son and you need the Savior. And by doing that, then just turn to him and receive him as Savior and Lord. That's what the thief on the cross did, did he not? Remember how easy Jesus made it for him? The thief on the cross said, oh Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, listen, you will be with me in paradise. Why? Because he just looked to Jesus down on that cross and realized He's exactly who he claimed to be. He's the Savior. He's the Lord. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. And God wants you to do the same thing. He wants you to believe and trust Him. So if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, you can do it right now. We're going to have prayer in a moment. You can turn to the Lord right now. You can just say something like this, Oh, God in heaven, listen, I admit to you that I am a sinner, and I just heard that in spite of that, you still love me. You say it in your word that... that you, you still love me. Even while I'm a sinner, you love me. Romans chapter 5. And because of that, you sent your son Jesus to die in my place on the cross of Calvary. So right now, I'm going to receive Jesus. I'm going to believe on Jesus. Right now, I'm inviting Jesus to be my Savior, Lord. If you'll do that, my friends, He'll save you right where you're sitting. He'll give you a free, full pardon of your sins. He'll save you the moment you do that. If you believe in your heart, just trust Christ. But also, as it says here, this verse of Scripture, let a man examine himself. I think we ought to look inward as well and outward as well, don't you? We ought to look at our own selves as believers. We ought to just look at ourselves. And if there's anything in our life that the Spirit of God is dealing with us about, perhaps we've let some nasty habits come into our life. I don't know. But we know that it's sin in our life and it shouldn't be there. And the Spirit of God... Is, is telling us that it should not be. We need to do so. We need to deal with it. Amen. The Bible says in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, it says that we need to examine ourselves. The psalmist is pleading. I think it's Psalm 139. We want to look at that real quick. 139, verse 23 and 24. The psalmist says, "Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts." And it says, see if thou be any way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. What it's saying here is simply this. And Paul is saying this as well. Believer, child of God, you need to look at your own life. 
If there's anything in your life that God has been dealing with you about, it could be a sin of commission. It could even be a sin of omission. James says if we know to do right, we don't do it. It's sin to us, right? Maybe perhaps we haven't been witnessing as we should. Perhaps we haven't been loving the Lord with all our heart, all our soul. All our, maybe we've been unfaithful. I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, listen, God is saying in His Word we need to confess it and deal with it. And as we do that, we'll find the forgiveness of the Lord. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 says, If we will confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? So it gives us an opportunity. And then lastly, listen to what it does to us. Every time we meet together and celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are saying to all those around Him, one day we believe that the Lord is coming in. Verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. What does the last three words say in that verse? Till he come. Till he come. I have read somewhere, it might have been this footnote here, or I read it. So it, whenever the Christians would meet in those early days of the New Testament church, they would come to this love feast, they would have a fellowship meal, then they would have the communion, and as they were doing that, they would remember what the Lord did for them, but at the same time, they were anticipating that the Lord is coming back one day real soon. They were looking forward to the Lord's coming. And I think, my friends, we ought to do the same thing. Do you realize one day that He is coming? Amen? He's coming just like He said He would. The, what we just celebrated, <coughs> we just celebrated the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. We said that last week, right? And just as he fulfilled all of those prophecies of the ancient prophets in the Old Testament, precisely, accurately, exactly like he said, the, the scripture said that he would, listen, the same passage as many of gives us the second advent as well. And for example, in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, we won't turn that because we don't have time. But in that same passage of scripture where there's a prophecy, that Christ will be born when a son will be given, a child will be born. In the same prophecy, two, two verses there, it tells us that he's going to come and he's going to reign and he's going to rule as well. That is on the board there. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That is a prophecy not only of his first coming, first advent, but a prophecy of his second advent as well. Do y'all realize this? Listen. Do you realize that Jesus has got to come? Amen. He's got to come. Do you remember when, when, when Jesus was arrested? And Jesus was arrested. And Peter, they called him Blade. He took the knife and cut off one of the servants' ears. Remember that? <coughs> and what did Jesus tell Peter? Luke, put up your sword. Don't you realize that these scriptures has got to be fulfilled. Every, this has got to happen to me. Jesus knew all things that would happen to him. And he told them, these things have got to happen to me. Amen. He said that, didn't he? He said to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, don't you realize, don't you understand all these things? They must have happened because they were prophesied in the Old, in the old Scriptures. So what I'm saying is this. The same prophecies that gives us the promises of His first coming also tells us that He is coming to Him. So He's got to come for us. And the way it looks today, I believe He's coming soon, don't you? So each time, listen, we celebrate the Supper of the Lord, we are saying to all those assembled, listen, He is coming to Him. Are you ready? Let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads. Every head bowed and every eye is closed and no one is leaving. And no one's looking around. We're going to have a serious prayer time now and give you this opportunity to examine yourself. First of all, let me speak to you. You may be here today. You may not be a believer. Never trusted Christ. Never been born again. You're not saved. And you know this. God knows this. And God's been speaking to your heart. He's been moving upon your heart. He's been dealing with you. He has been pleading with you. Convicting you. And calling you to come in. But you know you haven't as of yet trusted Christ. You've just heard the gospel as I shared it to you this morning. What better time than right now, right now, to turn to Him and trust Him and invite Him to be your Savior and Lord. It's so simple, it's so easy. All you have to do 
is called upon him. And if you're called upon him, he'll save you. Because the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll save you right now. Just tell him to say something like this. Father in heaven, Lord God in heaven, I admit to you that I am a sinner and I fall short of your glory just like your word says. And I realize that I cannot save myself. And so I know that, Lord, that I admit to you that I am a sinner. But I have heard that you still love me and you love me so much that that's what this is all about when we've been here this morning. That you sent your son Jesus to die in my place, in my room, in my stead. And right now, I trust Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe that he died in my place. I believe, in Lord Jesus, that you died in my place. I believe that you shed your blood just like we've heard this morning. Just like what your word said. We, I believe that you died. I believe that you was buried. I believe you was raised again the third day. Just like your word says. And you'll save any who call upon you right now. So, Lord Jesus, I'm calling upon you to save me right now. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. You might be a believer here today. You might be, you need to examine yourself. You might need to look inward. If that's anything in your life that, that you know that God's been dealing with you about, that should not be there, what better time right now to confess it to the Lord? It could be, maybe it could be an attitude. It could be a, uh, you know, some attitude of unkindness and forgiveness. Lord, you know what it is. God's been speaking to you about it. What about a time to right now to just confess it to him? It might be problems with another brother and sister in a, in a fellowship. I don't know. But you need to get make that right with God right now. You need to come clean, confess it. Just say something like this, Lord, you know you've been speaking to me about this. I know it's not right, but I'm confessing it to you right now. It's sin. I'm just asking you to forgive me of this sin. And I'm going to make it right. I promise you, if it's, if it's a problem I have with another believer, if that's an unkind, unforgiving spirit, whatever it is, I'm going to make it right with them. Because, Lord, I know that if I do not do this, and you're dealing with me about these matters, it is simply too dangerous and risky because I do not want to face this in the community. So thank you for your forgiveness, and I trust you for that forgiveness. And I thank you. And Father, now we pray as we go into the supper of the Lord that you would just bless each one that partakes of it. That you would bless in a very special way today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.